this is another uh, revised, edited version of the original narration for chapter 6. Human makes ultimate challenge to prove his loyalty to Daenerys. Um, William, the human, uh, challenges an unsullied warrior to prove himself to Daenerys. Now, of course, uh, because he was expecting a type of answer, which most Targaryens will not do, you know, because they don't just come out and say, yes, I've accepted you as my mate, my suitor, or to be the one to spend the rest of their life with. It's kind of like, you know, a uh, medieval-style Star Trek version of a Vulcan. You know, Vulcans aren't going to come directly and give you the answer you wanted. Well, to this human um, character here, because she doesn't come out and say, you know, like a confirmation, yes, I have accepted you. He thinks, okay, you know, um, I want to pull the fire, that's cool, I'm acknowledged as Dragon Spear. But she hasn't really, even though she has uh, somewhat marked me the first time, and of course the second time, she hasn't really confirmed that, you know, Yes, I I have chosen you. You are the person that I want to spend the rest of my life with. Oh, he thinks that now he has to do something more, you know, either to impress her or get her to confirm. Yes, you don't need to worry. I have chosen you to spend the rest of my life with. So when she learns that he, you know, after he does the swordsmanship skill, he has a choice of doing uh, what is called. Uh, a demonstration of swordsmanship skills, which, you know, just, you know, basically like showing what you learn. And then there's one called the Rite of Challenge. Now, when he asks for the Rite of Challenge, of course, that's his choice. She grants this. What she doesn't know is the human decides to pick a challenge. He knows that he can't get past the knights who compared to his height of five foot nine, because six foot is usually the standard height for her world, with the exception of Tyrion Lannister, who is about half his uh, height anyway. So, um, he decides to take on a, an unsullied warrior. Unfortunately, this does not impress Daenerys at all. She thinks that, okay, maybe he has deceived her at this point, because no one's ever defeated an assault lawyer. And why would this human do such a thing? She gives him a chance, you know, to back out, because she has to behold the laws of the kingdom. And that means once the challenge starts, it is until either she stops it, or to the death. And... Of course, she's also troubled by this because when he still asks for the right to challenge of the unsolved warrior, she knows that this could be her greatest loss because she can't show favoritism because of the fact he's human. So she has to, by the kingdom laws, allow this to go through. Um, in the end, um, she, he does have quite the battle scene in an arena, and he does several things that catches her eye and starts to, how would you say, in a combat-like turn-on, because she's never seen a human move in such ways, um, to the those of her world, to where he's able to get on his back and spin around or grab and be a solid warrior from using the back of his leg by the kneecap area to force him to fall onto the ground. So he's using things that would be considered in her world maybe somewhat of a barbaric type way of fighting. Tripping, yanking someone's legs out from under him, uh, doing things that would not be considered that, that an ordinary person uh, during any type of given combat in the known Seven Kingdoms of her world. So these tactics are now catching her eye and how agile this human is, but also because the air being thinner and the gravity being heavier, he's also concerned about that too, because he's not used to their atmosphere. So in the end, she eventually has to call to a stop because 
it's finally gotten to its favor, and as the blade comes to the unsullied warrior's throat, she calls out something um, that is considered by a guesstimate um, as Valerian. It would, uh, to William, he thinks it sounds like Malaysia, which could mean stop, but he doesn't know what that is. So, and even then, if that's wrong, somebody will have to look up what the words oh, stop in Valerian is, so that word can be appropriately put into the scene. And so he doesn't end up killing the uh, Unsullied Warrior. Now, this Unsullied Warrior just so happens to be one that is like a friend who trained with Grey Worm. It's not Grey Worm himself, but um, it is one that, you know, I guess he, it was him training with Grey Worm. They're kind of like, you know, Unsullied Warrior buddies or something like that. They've known each other for quite some time. And Grey Worm doesn't say anything. He just kind of, with a serious look, kind of almost like he's impressed, but not sure what to make of this puny human that was able to take down his a friend who is also an Unsullied Warrior. But then he does something as he's limping because he has a bad gash on his leg. And of course, now Daenerys seeing how bright red his blood is compared to that, um, people of her world. She sees where the human had mentioned his blood is bright red and burns red hot because he has the element of copper, which isn't a normal element of human blood. There's, of course, being darker is because they have the element of iron. Again, another telltale sign that he's on an alien world and he's the only human there. He had a special gift made at the time he had his armor made based on Greek mythology of his world. And so he thinking like a human, thinks he has to restore the honor of this unsullied warrior. And he hops back as best he can and um, offers his hand to the unsullied warrior, who kind of looks at him like he's not sure about his motives, but is not afraid about it anyway. He helps the unsullied warrior to his feet and offers him the dagger he especially made for him, thinking he's restoring his honor. Um, and so where even then ask him, why would you do this? You know, because his whole thing was to kill William, but William tells him, that was not my goal. I know your training is to kill me, but that was never in my intention. And he's probably right, because had she not called a stop to it, he probably would have been tossed like a bag of potatoes off him, and then probably the so worry would have finished him off. So... It, it kind of like she stopped it right within the nick of time before it could have progressed worse because really we could get really tired and now a lot of the heat is lost from its right leg. So the Unsullied Warrior, of course, puzzled by this human gesture, uh, looks at the dagger, slaps poor William on the arm, and uh, right above the wrist and says, good trade, or something to that effect. <laughs> well, so, well, it's like something you'd only hear on Earth. Um, Daenerys also is surprised by this action. This is a human custom, she thinks, because that's not something that normally one would do, you know. Um, it would be that, even though she did call a stop to it, that it was, should have been to the death. And when it didn't do that, because he not only obeyed her command to stop, but at the same time, he's like doing a custom that's only a human emotion to one who's not supposed to have human emotions. Because it's rare as solid warriors, they don't, just don't give a rip. You know, if the queen gives a command, uh, they're going to kill the enemy until somebody either outflanks them or kills them themselves. That's just how an unsullied warrior works. So she's kind of impressed by this strange human gesture he did for the Unsullied Warrior. She honors the Unsullied Warrior by saying he shall remain in the forces. And then, kind of after showing some concern about his leg, Masandi doing the best she can to help him stop the bleeding, he is knighted because he had requested this before the whole uh, challenge started. And so, as promised, he now gets to hold a position as a knight in her palace. So it's like now he's moved up the ladder a bit in uh, 
her trust in him. So she's greatly impressed, but she tells him in a somewhat stern way, you don't need to be doing this again. And he takes her word for it. He's not going to tick her off because she was not amused by this at all. And he explained to her what she asked. And she just that simply states, we don't explain ourselves. That may be of your world. That's not how we do it here. I've already accepted you. And as I told you before, when you offered that I should possess your soul, as I have already stated twice, I already have possessed your soul. She, she says this with quite a grin. And so he knows then probably he's not going to do anything like that again. Well, he has to get stitched up, and of course that will be probably not the most pleasant thing. There is something that numbs him based on their medieval style potions that he takes, and it'll feel like pressure going through his leg as they're stitching up the back of his right leg. In the meantime, she has a conversation with one of her knights, who seems to think that maybe the episode of Warriors are not that tough after all, but so she kind of lays into the night a bit. Uh, that perhaps maybe one of those that follow his command would like to try on the Soul Warrior. Well, he knows that since nobody has ever defeated them, except for those who were evenly matched like the Harpy. Uh, he kind of backs off and knows, well, maybe that wasn't a good thing to say, you know, making it look like she has weak uh, troops of the Unsolid Warriors. And so then she pretty much states something that makes sense. Well, since no human's ever been in the world before, and obviously he is the first and only of his race from a smaller dark blue star of the Larry Knight's type to defeat an Unsolid Warrior, she doesn't lose any face over this because there would be no other humans that would know how to find William through the vortex that brought him to her world. Therefore, the incident of him defeating an unsullied warrior is kind of like, in a symbolic way, hush, hush, keep it under the rug, nobody needs to know about this, because until somebody else can defeat an unsullied warrior, this was just mere coincidence. But she's not disappointed about this either, because this shows that there's promise to which a visionary has stated in the last period of time, that now she's starting to see that he could definitely be the one to lead her to victory. Uh, especially when she wasn't expecting him to challenge an unsullied warrior. So it was quite the banquet, and um, they celebrate, you know, the fact that he had, along with the other graduates of Swordsmanship's Guild, who are also recognized, uh, did something that is historical in her world to be the first human ever to defeat an Assault Warrior. Can you imagine the Assault Warrior is like uh, seven foot tall. That's one foot taller than Daenerys, who is six foot. William being only five nine, of course, Tyrion being shorter. So he gets the special cloak and other honorary awards that she presents him. She is, of course, very stimulated by certain other features of him that um, he looked pretty good with most of his hairy legs showing and that was to her quite the turn on because men in her world don't wear such armor but she doesn't say anything but it's you can almost imagine the thoughts as she's undressing with him, her eyes because this is this not something that she would see it's a human uh, type armor from old Greek mythology and they don't have such armor and so, to her, this is like another stimulation, you know, like, wow, why would a man be dressed like this? It looks like a woman's outfit with a skirt, <laughs> you know, she's not, she's not totally displeased about this. It just kind of gives her somewhat of a, an arousal that she has a little bit of control over on this. It's definitely, for her, an eye-raising experience as she's undressing with his eyes. And kind of looks away with a big smile, but doesn't say anything about it. Masandi also smiling about this as well, because it, it's just not the way men dress, even if it's in an arena. So, yeah, it's, it's something that they pretty much, she keeps to herself as her own pleasurable thoughts. In the meantime, uh, the scene will kind of switch like it would a regular episode series, where there's views of other kingdoms, affairs, what's going on. And if any producer thinks it needs to be additional scene lines, of course, that would be welcome. 
now we have to get to the uh, simple fact that as um, Daenerys is moved by this human custom, she finally decides that, you know, maybe if it was possible to visit others like his kind, that maybe humans are not as treacherous after all, you know, based on the actions of William. So he represented his race well. She also realizes why he did the challenge, and as I said before, convince him to not do anything else, because she already has accepted him, and she doesn't really want anything to happen to him, because for her, having him as a pet, as her uncle would always say, because she always took care of pets, and she still has this habit, since she was a young teenage Targaryen uh, girl, uh, this is one pet that she definitely treasures more than any of the wealth that she has, and because he doesn't want anything of her wealth, he doesn't purposely try to pursue her, these are great attractions for her. Especially the dumb things he does and says, and now taking his life in his hands. Uh, it's like, what would he not do? Probably go to, as he would say, to hell and back for her. So she kind of is really impressed by him and the things that he does. All right, now, there's not a whole lot to tell in Chapter 7. I mean, because this is like what we would call on Earth the uh, uh, the uh, Bachelor Party, except they don't call it that. You know, cleesey has got her own thing going. And that's not covered, of course. Because in reality, you would never know what your bride's doing with the other bridesmaids and what have you. So this focuses on... Um, the gathering of men to celebrate his being uh, ready to marry the queen. And so it just touches lightly on some of his experiences. Uh, unfortunately, he almost gets into trouble. And he doesn't realize that, you know, unless he knew the queen regent like everybody else does, even though she's on restrictions, uh, you kind of, that's all like uh, the fly who gets into the spider's web, you know. Fortunately, this human, being like the fly, is luckily to get out of that situation. I think it's because his best man came to his rescue because even his best man knows you don't want to go there. Trust me, man. <laughs> so he, he quickly breaks that uh, breaks that up right away. Because again, with, as long as Will's wearing the seal, uh, no. Uh, he's property of the Queen Khaleesi now. And even if she didn't kill William... Only granted, she would probably definitely uh, find another way to punish him because he has the cloak of her banner of the three dragons. He would have to live with the conscience that if Khaleesi decided to, she could actually take the life of the Queen Regent because of anything that might happen. And the best man's job is to make sure this doesn't escalate to that point. So... In the end, you could say to some point the best man came to his rescue, which saved everybody else from any further heartache and discomforts. But um, at the same time, the Queen Regent, you know, he freely admits, okay, wow, you know, Khaleesi's right. Queen Regent's pretty damn good looking, you know, and she's taller than Khaleesi. Uh, but again, as I had said before, the Queen Regent, you know, is almost reluctant to let him go. You know, you just don't have a man fall in her lap. But because the human is not of their world and short of stature, because they usually people for them, normal height is six foot and up. Now, as far as his best man being short, like I said, even though he's short, if you were to take him and put him next to a short person, of planet Earth, he would still be taller because um, the world being a lot bigger, his shortness is actually not that short. He's only half the size of William. So if William's five foot nine, was half of that? Well, four foot. If he's standing next to a midget of planet Earth, it would be more like uh, their two to three foot as opposed to his being just about four, a little over four foot. So there is some variances if you kind of can see the uh, the comparisons here. But also at the same time, you know, now that this battle scene had gone through, 
in chapter six, and they're celebrating together. Uh, William has never referred to him, uh, him as the bastard, even though he's probably used to that. And so there is like a buddy, best friend type bonding that's building here. You know, he's now got a new drinking buddy, even though he's human. Uh, William, don't call him a bastard. He, I guess he likes this. The fact that they are got a friendship building here, you know, and eventually, you know, if not that it would ever happen, you know, the queen's not going to do anything to displease her now husband. But the husband being the right hand and following in her stead would probably even say, hey, you know, nobody's going to kill my best friend. I named him my best friend. So whatever a king or queen says, I proclaim you a knight or what have you, she'd probably let him say, oh, yeah, you're right. You know, OK, so we're not going to do anything to your best friend. So it's like it's to his benefit now that William did proclaim him to be a best friend, because now that means that William will probably most likely stand up for him and say, hey, no, this ain't happening, you know, unless he purposely goes and kills somebody or something, you know, uh, of course, yeah, he, he knows once the queen Khaleesi makes her decision, he has to, he has no say in the matter. But on the other hand, um, he has a certain possible political leverage that maybe William's not aware that he has, which is also to the benefit of his best man, and the best man probably all might also might foresee this, that, hey, you know, nobody's going to mess with me anymore because now that I have him as a best friend, you know, I mean, not that I'm going to go break the laws and go piss in somebody's rose bed or something, you know. He's going to stand up for me because we're now drinking buddies or friends. Uh, unfortunately, William is not able to handle this wine of this world. You know, you go to a grocery store, you buy like these little bottle, mini bottles of alcohol, and they'll tell you what proof it is, 50 or 100 proof. Well, they don't have that in this world. And so his best man trying to look out for his in, uh, interests because of the position that William's now in, in the royal political sense, has got to protect his own interests. I got to keep this guy alive because I might need him someday. Uh, uh, you know, so without saying, coming out and saying it. So, you know, poor William, you know, he's just <laughs> totally making him, uh, uh, making himself look ridiculous for a human. And without thinking, you know, throws his arm around the Queen Regent. And again, she's eating all this up because it's like, wow, okay, you know, this is pretty cool. You know, this is like, you know, Queen Regent can see where the high sexual attraction and stimulation is starting to come up. But she knows she can't do nothing because as long as he wears that seal, there's not really anything she can do. And, of course, she's not dumb enough to try do anything further. But she has to enjoy what there is of it at that time. And so it was probably the most, um, how would you would say, probably hormonal experience for the Queen Regent to have this happen that this human throws his arm around her. I mean, the fact that they didn't kiss was probably amazing. And then he's trying to do what's right, but he's so messed up in the head with this alcohol that he ends up falling on the floors instead of saying, I was trying to bow to you. He said, I was trying to bow, you know, like a bowel movement. <laughs> and she's eating all this up and laughing about this because that's not what he meant to say. So it's got a, quite a bit of humor for this very short chapter.